everybody. In this video, I'm going to be going over fossil preservation. Fossil preservation requires two main criteria. To be preserved well, fossils need to have hard parts and be buried rapidly. What hard parts mean are things like skeletons. We have hard parts in our bones. This reconstruction of a dinosaur was made from its bones, and these bones were the things that were preserved, not any of its fleshy bits, because those things decompose really quickly. The rapid burial is important because, as you see here in the bottom picture, these fish were preserved in an almost perfect way because of being rapidly buried. If they hadn't been rapidly buried, they probably would have been eaten up by other animals or decomposed by bacteria and other microbes. So rapid burial and hard parts are the two main things. Next, taphonomy. Taphonomy is a term you need to know. It's the study of everything that happens to an organism after its death, any transport that might have occurred to the animal, any fragmentation, the type of burial, how fast the burial was, how slow it was, the diagenesis, which is alteration post burial. And don't confuse this term with taxonomy. We talk a lot about taxonomy in geology and paleontology, and taxonomy is the term we use to describe the classification and naming of things. Okay, so modes of preservation. There are different modes of fossil preservation, and the ones we'll be going over today are unaltered preservation, such as the freezing of a mammoth, recrystallization, such as the recrystallization of aragonite into calcite in a mollusk shell, replacement, such as replacement of the aragonite or calcite minerals completely with a different mineral, such as pyrite in this picture, Permineralization, such as the opalization of petrified wood caused by the precipitation of silica within pores of the wood or sometimes things like bones because water that is rich in silica might flow through and precipitate out those silica minerals. Carbonization, in which carbon-rich materials such as organic matter from plants or animals are preserved as a thin film of carbon. And indirect preservation, such as mold and cast and biochemical signatures. Biochemical signatures are not pictured on this slide, but I'll show you them later. And molds and casts are shown here. You can see that a mold is basically an impression of a fossil, and then the cast is the filled out version. And casts aren't made with original fossil material. They're actually made by way of mold formation through the dissolution of the actual fossil material. And then sediment or other minerals that precipitate out of solution go and fill that mold, forming a cast of the fossil. To get a little bit more specific, here is unaltered preservation. Again, like I talked about the frozen mammoths example or frozen anything that can become frozen. Another really good example of unaltered preservation is insects being preserved in amber or feathers being preserved in amber, which is how we know that dinosaurs had feathers. Well, one of the ways at least, which I think is pretty cool. So these unaltered preservation modes are the most helpful for us trying to understand geologic history because they are unaltered and so we don't have to make any guesses. I mean it's right there all the answers so it's nice. The next type recrystallization like I said can happen to aragonite in mollusk shells. Their shells are made of aragonite originally typically and then can recrystallize into the more stable form of calcite which is the same composition of aragonite but a different crystal structure and in this picture the aragonite can be seen on the outer rims of the shells with more specific structures and lines from the original structure of the shell and then the larger crystals that don't retain that structure of the shell are the calcite that has been recrystallized. Then we have here replacement. Replacement, like I said, can be done by pyrite replacing aragonite or calcite, and this is called pyritization. Or you can have opalization, which is a type of replacement as well, and you can see the opal replacing the original carbonate material in this ammonite. Next, we have permineralization. Like I said, anything that's porous, like wood or bones, can be subjected to permineralization. Water flows through that is rich in some sort of soluble mineral that might precipitate out in those pores, which solidifies that porous material. Next, carbonization is most common in plants and fish that get buried quickly and their carbon-rich makeup becomes this thin film of a fossil in between layers of sediment. Molds and casts, like I said, molds are the impression of the fossil and casts are the refilled in mold of the fossil. Now, I put a trick here on this slide. To the left, you can see this 
trilobite mold and cast. But on the right, I wanted to trick you guys because this is actually not a cast and mold. It is a actual fossil and then a mold of that fossil. This is not a cast because it is not refilled in by the sediment. It is the actual material of the fossil. You can kind of tell the shell material is still there. And the one to the right of that is actually a mold because that is still just an impression. Next, we have biochemical signatures. Stromatolites are fossils of bacterial mats. BIFs stand for banded iron formations. These are these intermittent red and black layers in this rock here. Basically, this was a really big deal for something we call the Great Oxidation Event, which we'll talk about in the Precambrian video. But basically, these deposits formed when oxygen first started accumulating on Earth, and the reduced iron that was deposited in the ocean became oxidized and formed these super extensive red oxidized iron deposits. And this might be indirect, but it is a biochemical signature that indicates that oxygen was accumulating and therefore photosynthetic organisms were evolving. The next thing is graphite. We are sometimes able to get carbon isotopes from graphite that can tell us whether photosynthetic organisms were around or not because of the differences in the way that photosynthetic organisms take up carbon based on the isotope, leaving behind in the atmosphere and rock record signatures of carbon isotope ratios. Next, we have pyrite. Pyrite can be a biochemical signature, meaning we can take isotopes from the sulfur in pyrite, which can tell us whether organisms went into the isotopic fractionation that we see in the pyrite or not. Another thing that we can look at at pyrite is its morphology or size and structure, which can also go into telling us if life was involved in its formation. There are plenty more biochemical signatures in the rock record that we can use to indicate whether life was involved in a process or not. These are just some examples. Next, pseudofossils. Pseudofossils are important to notice because you don't want to mistake something for life that isn't. Some examples of pseudofossils are marcasite, which is a polymorph of pyrite or type of pyrite that forms this really radial, perfectly circular crystals that just look like they had to do something with life because they don't look like natural processes made them. Again, with the septarian nodules, kind of the same thing. They kind of look like eggs, but they're not. They're made by natural processes, as well as dendritic textures, which some might mistake for carbonized plant fossils, but they're not. They are formed by the dissolution and transport of water through fractures and rocks, and they form these branching-like structures that really might trick you. Next, we're going to go into classifications, and this is where you might actually use the term taxonomy rather than taphonomy. In this life tree that we have here in this slide, you can see there are three main groups and these three groups at the top here we call domains, and these domains are bacteria, archaea, and eukaryota. We are eukaryotes, which are multicellular organisms like animals, fungi, and plants, whereas bacteria and archaea are single cellular, and when you talk about them together, we call those prokaryotes. An example of prokaryotic fossils include the bacterial mats made by cyanobacteria that we call stromatolite in the rock record, other than these fossilized bacterial mats, however, the fossil record for prokaryotes is pretty slim other than biochemical signatures. For this reason, we're going to be focusing on eukaryotic fossils within the kingdom Animalia for the rest of this lecture. Animalia includes both invertebrates and vertebrates, and we'll start with invertebrates. First invertebrate we're talking about is the phylum Porifera. Porifera includes mostly sponges, and in the rock record, you might not think that sponges have much of a record, but they do because most sponges are either calcareous or made of calcium carbonate or silicious or made of silica. And carbonate material and silica are really well preserved in the rock record because they're what we call hard parts. And so here's some examples of sponge fossils as well as sponge spicules that had been preserved. You can see in the bottom left image, this is a microscopic image of sponge spicules. These spicules change in morphology depending on species. And so because because of this, if we use a microscope, we can pretty much tell what species or at least what broader type or order or family of sponge we're looking at. The next group of invertebrates is the phylum called Cnidaria. Cnidaria include corals and jellyfish, but since jellyfish don't really get preserved in the rock record very well because they don't have hard parts, we're going to be focusing on corals. Corals are calcareous organisms that can either form in large colonies, which we call reefs, or be solitary, which are what these rugose horns are. You can see here on the right, this rugose. These rugose corals and tabulate corals shown at the bottom, the one that looks like a bunch of straws clumped together, they're both extinct. 
The only coral group still living is the Scleractinians, which you can see on the bottom right. The next invertebrate group we're going to be talking about is Bryozoa. Bryozoans have been around since the Cambrian and are still around, and they are all marine, and they look like these lacy fans or twiggy structures in rocks and are typically encrusting, meaning that they live on other solid things, whether it be sediment or corals or other animals. The next invertebrate phylum we'll be going over is mollusca, and this is what I meant by mollusk. Mollusks include three main groups, cephalopods, gastropods, and bivalves, and limnites. I forgot to write that down, but that's important. That's the fourth main group. And these have been around since the Cambrian as well. And here are some pictures of examples of a bivalve at the left, an ammonite at the top, a bolemnite at the right, and you can see the internal structure of a bolemnite below the fossil bolemnite. And so you can see it kind of looks like a mini squid. And squids, by the way, are cephalopods, so they are mollusks. And then finally at the bottom, you can see gastropods. And these are just snail shells. The next phylum we'll go over in invertebrates is brachiopoda. Brachiopods are somewhat similar to what we saw in the previous slide with bivalves, but they have different symmetry. So if you want to recognize the difference between a bivalve and a brachiopod, you just need to look at the symmetry. For example, at the bottom, you can see that brachiopods are symmetrical along the top middle of their shell. And bivalves, or plesiopods, are symmetrical going between their two shells. And this is because bivalves sometimes curve near their hinge, and so they're not symmetrical along the top of their shells, but brachiopods are symmetrical along the top of their shells, but not in between their two shells because one shell is typically smaller than the other for brachiopods. So just remember symmetry for brachiopods and bivalves. Most of the time you can recognize the differences when you're looking at the two. The next phylum we'll talk about for invertebrates is arthropoda. Arthropoda have been around since the Cambrian as well. In modern day, they include things like insects, crustaceans, and arachnids, like crabs, shrimps, lobsters, spiders, scorpions, ticks, mites, etc. And two really important groups of extinct arthropods are Eurypterids, shown in the picture on the top, and Trilobites, shown in the bottom picture. Eurypterids and Trilobites make really good index fossils, which means that they can tell us exactly where we are in the rock record. And this is because things like Eurypterids and Trilobites, while they might have had a long time range, they were widespread throughout the world, and their morphology changed quickly enough through time we can tell pretty much wherever we are in geologic history when looking at Paleozoic rocks. The next phylum of invertebrates is Echinodermata. Echinoderms have also been around since the Cambrian and are still around in the present. And they include organisms like starfish, crinoids, echinoids, like sand dollars, blastoids, and pretty much anything with five-sided symmetry, otherwise known as pentagonal or radial symmetry. This makes them pretty easily distinguishable. And something that's really cool is modern-day crinoids. If you've never seen a crinoid, this on the bottom picture is what they look like in the fossil record because typically they get broken up into just their stem parts. But in modern life, they look so cool and this is what they look like because this is their head. Their head doesn't get preserved very often. You can see here a beautiful preservation of a crinoid head in the bottom right picture, but typically it's just their stem that's preserved, and so they don't look as beautiful in the rock record, but they are, as you can see. Also, keep in mind the reason their heads don't get preserved very well is because they're more feathery and less hard, and so the stems, where the hard parts are, are clearly what's going to be preserved in the rock record. And before we get to the vertebrates, we have to bridge the gap. One of the organisms that is neither invertebrate or vertebrate that kind of bridges the gap between the two is called a graptolite, which is in the phylum hemi chordata, and graptolites were around from the Cambrian to the Mississippian, and they also make a really good index fossil. Finally, we get to chordata, which are our vertebrates. These have been around since the Cambrian, but not as we know them. Before fish, there were just fish-like organisms that weren't quite fish yet, but weren't hemichordata, so we classified them as chordata, and they did show up in the Cambrian. However, fish did not show up until the Ordovician, and now they are still present, and the Ordovician is the period just after the Cambrian. Brand. And then in the Devonian, amphibians showed up. And then in the Pennsylvanian, reptiles showed up. And then in the Triassic, mammals showed up. And then in the Jurassic, birds showed up. And just to remind you, it goes Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Mississippian, Pennsylvanian, Permian, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous. And then it's in the Cenozoic. So the times in which fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and birds showed up was scattered throughout the Paleozoic and Mesozoic eras. Lastly, we're going to be talking about plantae. 
plants have been around since the Cambrian. However, even though they only showed up in the Cambrian, which is around 540 million years ago, photosynthesis was around way before that because of bacterial species that could perform photosynthesis, such as cyanobacteria, as we saw in the stromatolites that caused the formation of those BIFs, the painted iron formations, because the oxygen from the photosynthesis that went into the water and accumulated in the ocean caused the oxidation of that iron. So just remember that the photosynthesis does not have to be only plants. There are also other phototrophic microbes other than cyanobacteria, but I won't be talking about them today unfortunately, but I will in later videos, so tune into those. Another thing to note about plants is that flowering plants didn't show up until the Cretaceous. The plants had quite a while before they actually began flowering. Once they hit the Cretaceous started flowering, they went crazy with diversity, and ever since then their diversity has been extending. The last thing I want to talk about is how we can use fossils as paleoenvironmental indicators. Fossils are really helpful because things like calcium carbonate contain both carbon and oxygen isotopes, which can give us really good information about the environment and the climate during that time. For example, we can use oxygen and carbon isotope signatures in corals and mollusks because they are made up of carbonate material. Another thing we can use is dendrochronology, which is the study of tree age, but not only can we use it to age trees, we can also take the composition of the tree during each year or layer of its growth to understand the composition of the atmosphere during each of those years. Another thing we can use is the morphology of plant fossils. So if leaves are smooth versus if they are spiky versus if they're fat, if they're thin, all these things indicate to us certain environmental factors because we know in modern day where certain trees with certain types of leaves like to live, and this can be useful for past environmental indications as well as the carbonate isotope signatures within the leaves material if there's enough carbon material there to analyze. Also, the morphology of a microfossil called foraminifera can be super helpful. Foraminifera are, like I said, microscopic, so you can't really tell anything with your naked eye. It just looks like a grain of sand if you look at it with your eyes. But if you put it under a microscope, these organisms are extremely complex. They form tests or skeletons with chambers that can coil in certain directions. And when certain species of these coil to the right versus coiling to the left, we can tell the temperature of the ocean water in which they formed in, which is super awesome that we figured all that out. And then also these fossils are also made of carbonate material. And so we can use the oxygen and carbon ratios from them to further estimate water temperature and water chemistry composition during the time of their formation. Lastly, we can reconstruct atmospheric and environmental conditions using palynology, which is the study of pollen. Pollen, as you can see, is more complex than you probably thought when you put it under a microscope. It has these beautiful structures and the structure as well as the composition of the pollen can tell you a lot about the environment during the time that it was distributed in. Thank you so much for watching. And if you want to learn more about fossils as paleoenvironmental indicators, I will be talking about that way more in later episodes on stable isotopes. So I can't wait to see you there. Bye.